Welcome to the San Juan High School Library. My name is Michelle Sanini and I am your teacher librarian here at San Juan. And today I would like to give you a tour of our facility. Uh, before we begin, I would like to tell you that we are in the middle of a massive remodel. And so as you can see, it's a mess in here. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll look at that as we walk around. First thing I'd like to point out though is right over here when you come in, this is Miss Land's desk. Miss Land is our ICT. She is the textbook clerk. So when you need to check out textbooks or return them, you come to this table and Miss Land will help you. Unfortunately, right now, we don't have any set hours and Miss Land is frequently not in here, um, but we're hoping to work on that for next year so that she will be here um, on more of a, a scheduled basis so you know when you can return your uh, textbooks or when you can check them out. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue to walk along here. And all along this wall over here, this is going to be our fiction section where almost all fiction is going to go. Previously, the librarian had something called an insider library, and so he had books by subgenres. So he would have adventure and mystery and historical fiction, and it was extremely confusing for the students. And uh, honestly, this year, trying to figure out the system has also been very confusing for me. So part of why it's such a mess is that we are having to uh, take down every single book one at a time or having to relabel them and put them back on the shelves so that's what's going on eventually it's going to like these first three or four shelves here you know look hopefully pretty nice and neat and that's what we're working towards so again this is where the majority of our fiction is going to go along the wall right here um, down a little bit further there we will also have a separate section for graphic novels Okay, so that you can find those if you're looking for graphic novels. Um, if you come back here then, this is where you can see that some demolition's being done and it's really quite messy right now. This was where all of the nonfiction was housed and what we're doing right now is um, we're going to move the bookshelves against the back wall there, providing more room in here for students to read and um, hang out, uh, you know, places for students to work on projects and things together. So we're trying to open up the space. So nonfiction will go against this wall and then hopefully partially over that wall. So this is still something that we are working on. Um, and a lot of our nonfiction also we are going through. It's very old. Um, a lot of it's from the 70s and 80s. And we obviously need to update and get more current nonfiction so that when you are looking at, for instance, maybe a book on engineering, it's actually relevant to you and it's not 30 years old. So that's one of our goals is to really redo the nonfiction section and make it more relevant. So if you come along this wall over here, you will see this wall is, uh, this large bookcase is the reference section. This section is going to go away. Um, we obviously will still have references, but, um, Upon further consideration and talking with other librarians, it makes sense. What we're going to do is, first of all, a lot of this is terribly outdated and is going to go away. Um, but then the reference books that we are going to hold on to will make their way into the nonfiction section, and they will be housed there just like in the whole nonfiction section according to the Dewey Decimal System. So depending on what you look for, that's where you'll find it. Part of why we're doing this also is that currently the reference books are not available for checkout. So you have to sit down in the library, use the reference, but you can't take it from the library. And, you know, it's not like we have any irreplaceable valuable types of books or anything here. We want to make sure that they are available to students. So we are going to place them in the nonfiction section against that wall and then they'll be available to you to check out. Um, this whole wall over here where the windows are, this whole section is going to be remodeled and taken out. There's not a whole lot here right now. It's just kind of a a lot of junk honestly and we are going to get some uh, counter height tables here along with some counter height stools and we'll be moving all the computers along the windows here um, ideally we would love to get some new computers but for now we will use what we have in the library so as we continue along here another problem this year as you can see is that we are housing all kinds of computers on wheels here. Um, the, my administration is looking for a better place for them, but right now they kind of sit in here um, and this is obviously not acceptable. So by next year, there will be a place for them, but it's we're kind of a holding tank right now. Um, and with the remodel, we certainly wanna keep the library open to students. Um, but again, it's, 
it's pretty messy in here right now. So if we come back here, you can see that this section back here is currently where the computers are housed and this is where students work but again the idea is to move this section over by the windows just to give students more light kind of there's a nice view out there into the garden area and um, this area then is going to become an area for specific types of fiction so we're going to be looking for um, science fiction and fantasy will be placed over here as students that are typically drawn to those genres tend to go to those genres, so we kind of wanted to separate them so that they have their own spot. Um, we are also going to have a section over here for books that are written in Spanish and other languages that are spoken here by our students. Um, and so that's, that's what's going to go on here. The back room over there is currently being remodeled and changed into the textbook room. Right now, the textbooks, you have to go back through this whole area. Um, this is my desk right now that's incredibly messy. I've gotten a lot of books in. I'm trying to do a lot of cataloging and so forth. But you have to go through there, and there's simply not enough room. So when, when the textbooks are returned in the spring, they sit on the tables all summer long, and then um, in the fall, students check out their textbook, but what that usually means is that the library is closed for two to three weeks, both at the beginning and the end of the year, and we want to make sure that it can be available to students at all times, and that's why we are changing this back room into a textbook room. So starting next year, students will come through the hallway outside of that room. They'll come through here and get their textbooks, and then they'll check them out. Sick tour of the library and what we have available. We are really looking forward to the start of the 2017-18 school year when the remodeling will be hopefully mostly finished and we'll have a nice um, great space for students some new furniture and of course we're working really hard to do everything we can to get some new books in here as well. So thank you for joining me today and I look forward to welcome welcoming you to the San Juan High School Library. Now that we've taken a tour of the physical space in the library I would like to discuss with you the available print and electronic resources that we have here for you. Obviously, we have lots of books in the library, and as I discussed, we are doing our best to get some funding in order to buy more recent books and more relevant books. We do have a selection of magazines currently. We have Time, Air and Space, National Geographic, Leatherneck, Bicycling, Liberty, Art News, and Popular Mechanics. And as this is my first year here in the library, I am looking to see um, what interest students have in these current magazines, and I will renew those that are being used and not renew the others. And I'm also interested in finding out from students other magazines you would be interested in seeing the library get a subscription to. Now, electronically, of course, we have the Destiny Catalog, and that is how you look for books and materials that we have in the library. Later on in this video, I will walk you through a tutorial of how to use Destiny Catalog. And of course, we have internet access here for you. Now, future resources I would like to see us get, hopefully in the upcoming years. First thing is I would like to have at least one database here available for students to use when doing research. And I'm also working hard to get some funding for both eBooks and audiobooks. Unfortunately, we currently do not have either of these, but again, it's something I'm trying to work on going forward as I think that they are a great asset to students. As we continue on in our library orientation, right now I'm going to show you how to access our school website and how to get information about the library from the website. To begin with, you'll see up here that you're going to go to www.sanjuan.edu slash San Juan and this screen will appear. Now there are two things I want to point out to you. Under departments and staff, this is where you're going to find information about the library. And we'll look at that in a moment. First, however, I would like you to notice under quick links, we do have a quick link that takes you to our online library catalog and I will be discussing that further on in our orientation. Let's go back, however, to our creative library, and I'm gonna go ahead and take you to the site. Now, as we're waiting to get there, there we go. 
Uh, I do need to state a few things. First of all, this website is old and a lot of the information here is no longer relevant. Unfortunately, I have been, uh, this is my first year here, and I have been unable to make any changes to the website because I do not have the authority, according to my administration, to make changes to the website. So at some point, my idea is to put together what I would like to see on the website and then speak with the individual who is in charge of making the changes. So unfortunately right now, our website is really terribly outdated. Uh, the one thing that is useful, and again, we will discuss this in a moment, is that you can also see that you can get to the San Juan online catalog here as well. Uh, but as I did point out on the homepage, there is a quick link there. Um, there is this section on the Library Media Center that has frequently asked questions, and this would be very useful information. I'll go ahead and take you to the page. This would be great information if it was actually accurate. Again, unfortunately, this was created by our former librarian um, years ago, and so a lot of this no longer applies. Um, also, um, our former librarian had some very uh, interesting ideas about a library, so he has all these things about the Green Library, the Library Bookstore Cafe, and so forth. Um, again, the bulk of this is really not useful. Um, for instance, when we go over here, magazines and newspapers, we click on this. And you can get some nice links here to the Sacramento Bee, New York Times, and so forth. So this one link is still relevant. Unfortunately, though, our school does not have access to a database currently. So EBSCO host, if you go here, you'll see what happens. It simply says we're not authorized to access this site. So I'm assuming at some point we had access to this database, but we currently do not at this point. So let's go ahead and go back here. Um, the electronic references are also woefully outdated. He created a link, for instance, to Google, which there's really, you know, everyone can just get on Google. This Internet Public Library, I looked at this site, um, and if you look and read right in here, Basically, this site is no longer being updated, so that is also woefully out of date. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit more information here. There's, there's really not much um, of use, sadly, at this point. So this is something that where our website needs a lot of work to help students uh, find this resource to be helpful and useful. And uh, that is a goal, certainly, that I have here. Um, I've just been so inundated with remodeling and taking over a library that is, you know, not been vetted. Nothing's been done to it for, for you know, 20, 30 years. So at this point, uh, the website has kind of been on the back burner. But I do definitely have some ideas for what I want to do here to make it user-friendly for students. So by the end of excuse me, by the beginning of the 2017-18 school year, we will have a website up and running that is helpful to students and staff. Now that we have looked at the website for the library, I would like to take you on a journey through the online library catalog so that you understand how this works. This will be a very useful tool for you in helping to find different materials that you're looking for within our library system. So again, we're going to go to sanjuan.edu slash sanjuan, which is going to be the website for our school. And we're just going to go down to the quick link where it says online library catalog. And we will click on here. And you're going to go down to new San Juan High School and click on there. And you'll see here, this is a basic search that comes up. And it gives you a couple different ways to search for a book that you're looking for or a different material, not necessarily a book. One way to do that is by a keyword. So let's say, for instance, that I know, oh, there's this book and I don't quite remember the title, but I know it has the word cities in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to type in the word cities here and we're going to hit keyword. And here you see 
there's a whole host, so I'm going down and I'm looking at the different ones, and oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for, A Tale of Two Cities. So again, if you know maybe part of a title and not the full title, that can be a really helpful way to look, is to go under Keyword. <clears throat> now, of course, if you know the actual title, then you can just type that in. So of course, if I type in A Tale of Two Cities, and I do that by title, it will pop up right here. There's a Tale of Two Cities, and then we also have the Cliff's Notes that give you some help in understanding the book. And what it does here is it's going to give you the information on where to find the book. So you'll see right here we have the call number. So you're going to go to the fiction section of the library. The FIC, of course, stands for fiction. And the author's last name, Dickens. So you will go to our fiction section. And then you will go, it's all alphabetized, so you will find this section for D, and then look for Dickens. The other thing that you'll find right here is it tells you how many we have available. So it shows you that our library has four copies, and that currently all four of those copies are available. Now, one other way to search, of course, is by author. So sticking with the same author here, let's go ahead and put in Charles Dickens. And we'll go by author. And the author, this feature can be great if you've read something, uh, let's say for instance, Sarah Dessen, she's a very popular author with teenagers. And so if I like one of her books and I think I'd like to read more books by her, this can be a great way to do that search. So again, looking for Charles Dickens here, we have Great Expectations, David Copperfield, and so on and so forth. You can see several books, quite a few by him that come up there. So this would be, again, um, I think it's a great way if, again, you have found an author that you're really enjoying and would like to see if our library contains more books by that author. Now also, you can of course look by subject. So maybe I am looking for books about airplanes. So here I can go to subject. And you'll see that here's all kinds of things about airplanes, aviation, you can see there's two full pages of it. And so I can scroll down. Maybe I'm looking for information on, for instance, modern military aircrafts. So this one might grab my attention. You can see in this instance, a lot of these, their call numbers, it's gonna be the Dewey Decimal System. So you'll be going in the nonfiction section and looking according to the numbers here. So here we've got a 629. 0.13 AV, 629.13 MO. So that's again, those would be found in the nonfiction section. And then one other one I want to show you here before I show you some other features is this one for series. So sometimes, oftentimes, students will read a book and either they're not sure if it's part of a series or they, they know it is, but they don't remember the other books. So let's say that I have read Divergent. And I know it's a series, but I'm not sure what the other titles are. I can click here on this button, Series. And it takes me, oh, okay, so there's also Allegiant and there's also Insurgent. And what's nice here is we can see also, if we look here, that uh, there's actually three copies of Divergent. Um, and we can see it says Divergent Series 1. But what's nice now, I can see that Insurgent is the Divergent Series 2. So I know this is the next book I should read in the series. And then up here, Allegiant, Divergent Series number 3. So that will be the third one in the series. And so it tells me not only the titles, but it tells me in what order. And of course, it again also tells me where I will find these. So these are currently under Insider Science Fiction for Roth. Um, and again, we are redoing the insider library that was there previously. So in the future, these would be found simply in the uh, science fiction section. All right, so a couple other things too to narrow your search here. Currently, I have been uh, looking for the location here at our high school, New San Juan High School. However, you can elaborate. Um, you can look at all the high schools. You can look throughout the San Juan, throughout our entire district, at any libraries, uh, what books we may have available. So if you are interested in that, you can go down to high schools, see if other high schools may have a book, and then we could do an interlibrary loan for you. The material type, um, usually students are looking for a book. 
uh, but if you are looking for something else, let's say for instance an ebook, you can see uh, that there's different types of materials and this is how you search for them. You can put in the reading level uh, that may or may not be helpful. Not all of the books uh, have, have that kind of information, so this can be a little tricky. I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this. And then the interest level, uh, this is just basically based on age. And in the, if, you're, if you're looking at our high school library, uh, you really don't need to use this feature because the majority of our books are obviously geared towards high school students. However, if you were looking, let's say, throughout the district, and all of our libraries, then you may want to limit it, let's say, from ninth grade, you know, to twelfth grade, something like that. Okay, that way you won't get elementary school type of books on subjects you're looking for. So that's the basic one. And one other feature I would like to show you then is the power. And uh, as we've talked about with some of the Boolean language that you can use to help your searches, and or and not. Uh, these features can help you to really refine your search and give you a better sense of what you're looking for. So I'm going to go ahead and put in the keyword of uh, mental illness and, and the and has already um, been highlighted here for me, and then I'm going to put in uh, depression. And so it will look for both of these terms together because we're using that Boolean word of and. I'm going to go ahead and click on search. And here it looks like don't have a large selection, but if you were looking uh, for to do some research on this, we do have one book. And again, you can see the call number. This would be in the nonfiction section, 616.89, last name Summers. Uh, also, some other information here too. It tells you it was published in 2000. So the information is probably a little bit dated, um, but it also gives you like a reading level, interest level, and so forth. So that again is just uh, one thing that might be helpful. You'll notice too that this page is printable if you'd like as well. So if you want to print this out, you're welcome to do so from the library, uh, the library computers and print it out using our printer. So going back here then, so that's the power feature. And basically that's about all you're, you're going to want to use. Uh, same kind of information here. Location, are you looking just at the high school? Again, the material type. You can choose a publication year. So if you know, for instance, you're doing something on uh, science and you want information that is relatively new, you can put, you know, after, during, or before. So maybe after the year of 2012, just to make sure you're getting pretty up-to-date information. So um, again, it does give you some of that way to limit your search even further. And really, this is uh, pretty much all there is to it. Go back to basic here. Um, this is, again, probably what you will use the most when you come into the library. Uh, go ahead and, and have a seat at one of our computers. You know, see if you can use this to find what you're looking for. And of course, as always, if you have any additional questions or need further assistance, please come see me. Thanks. Welcome to the portion of this video where we are going to be talking about how to conduct an effective search. So we're going to be using Google today and I'm going to talk to you about search mechanics and how you can best search and come up with relevant information and hopefully refine your search as well and so that you have a better chance of coming up with results that are useful for you. A quick word before we get started today, uh, in the future, we are certainly hopeful that we are going to have at least one or maybe more databases available for you to search for information. But at this point, our school unfortunately does not have a database, so I am going to show you how to search using Google, something you're all very familiar with. But um, again, hopefully I'm going to give you some uh, ideas and tips here for how to have a more effective search. So to begin with, I had mentioned search mechanics. Search mechanics are basically the commands that you're giving to the search engine so that it can return information that is relevant to your search. By using these mechanics, you have a much better chance of finding the information you're looking for. So I'm going to focus today on the most useful and simplest of search mechanics known as Boolean logic. Now Boolean logic consists of three basic operators. So it consists of using one of these following words, either the word and, the word or, or the word not. 
and you will type in those words in all caps as you will see in just a moment. But by using these words in between your search terms, you have a better chance of narrowing your results and getting some relevant information. So here's an example I want to show you. I'm going to be doing a paper, let's say, on um, social media and depression. So I'm going to start and I'm just going to put in the term social media. When I do that, you can see that I get an enormous amount of results about social media. Okay, you can see right here. Um, I get, you know, definitions for social media, you know, I get a Wikipedia page, um, social media about all these. But let's say that again, I'm trying to do a paper on social media and depression. So what I can see as I scroll down here is it doesn't look like most of this is going to be very helpful to me. You know, how Twitter is changing modern warfare, for instance, doesn't look like it would help me to write a paper on social media and depression. In addition, again, I've gotten an enormous amount of results to sift through. Now, let's say that I just try the word depression. Okay, again, I get an enormous amount of results here as well. Okay, and if I scroll down, I get a definition for depression, some basics about it. So some of this might be useful to me, but again, if I'm looking specifically for how social media can affect or, or what effect it has on depression, I'm not seeing a whole lot here. Okay, um, maybe the teen depression and anxiety that one might might have some stuff about social media, but um, basically, you know, again, this is about depression in general. Now, if I go back up, though, and I use Boolean language, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to type in the term social media, but then I'm going to use the term AND in all caps, and then depression, because what I'm looking for here is a link between the two. I am looking for articles that are both about social media and depression, so the effects of it. Now, I understand this is still a huge uh, amount of articles, obviously. You're not going to sift through anything near this amount. But we have narrowed it down considerably, actually. And now what we're getting is articles that look uh, specifically about social media. I mean, if you start to look here, social media depression, depression and social media, research links heavy Facebook, and social media usage to depression. So you can see that we're getting um, much more what, what it is that I'm looking for for my paper. Uh, now, in addition, I can go ahead and search, I can, uh, excuse me, I can go ahead and refine my search even further. So let's say that I also want to know, well, okay, so there's probably a link between social media and depression, but I'm looking specifically on how does this affect a girl's body image. So I'm going to continue to use Boolean language of and, and I'm going to put in body image. And again, I'm going to put in girls. So now I've been very specific. Now I'm looking for articles that are going to target social media and depression, but also body image and girls, all of these things combined. Again, a really, really large amount of results were returned because this is, uh, you know, a heavily studied area, lots of articles and so forth about it. But if you compare this to what we initially were looking at, um, the results have been narrowed down significantly. And now if we look like at my very first article here, teen social media and bo body image. So if that's what I'm looking for, and that's what my paper's on, you can see how significantly um, refined my search has been and how much more helpful these will be for the paper that I wish to write. Let's say I'm doing a research paper, compared to, again, if I had just typed in a word like social media or a word like depression. So using the Boolean language of and really helps to refine your search and should help you come up with better results. Uh, and please note, you can use the language as many times. In my search, I've used and three times. If you want to refine it even further, you could, of course, continue to add that language in there. So maybe you would want to maybe add an additional term like and um, teen you know, if you just want to focus on teen girls and then see what you come up with there. All right, so that's again, that's one of them is the word and that you can use as the Boolean language. The other two are going to be the words or and not. And they work in a similar way to and, um, 
with the word or, you're going to actually be broadening your search, or in the case of the word or, you will be narrowing your search by, uh, excuse me, uh, in, case, in the case of the word not, you'll be narrowing your search by eliminating uh, a word there. So looking at those, if I did, for instance, social media or depression. Okay, you can see again, I'm going to get an enormous amount of results. And what I'm going to get is either of these search terms are appearing. So I will find some articles about social media here, and then I will find some articles about depression. Okay, um, but for instance, if we scroll down, like this, this one is clearly just about social media. So that is used to widen it. So obviously with a topic like this, you're probably not going to want to widen your search. You're probably actually looking to narrow it. But um, if you do have some more specific things that you're looking for, the OR feature can be useful. Finally, in addition to the Boolean language of the word AND, the word OR, you can also type in the word NOT. So we have social media, NOT depression. And if you do that, that will limit your search by only looking for words with social media, but it will not have the word depression in it. So if there's a specific term, if I want to look at social media, but again, nothing with the term depression, this is what I would do. Now that you have an understanding of how to use the Boolean language to refine your searches, I want to take a look at how to ensure that the websites you're looking at are credible and reliable. So what I've done here is I've gone to this website, martinlutherking.org. Oftentimes, students make the assumption that if a website ends in .org, there's a sense of reliability to it. So for many students, this looks like a great website for Martin Luther King. So what I'd like to do is let's take a look at it and see if, in fact, this would be an accurate and reliable source of information. As I'm looking at the first page here, one of the things, I'm just kind of looking through it, kind of looks okay. Of course, I'll want to click on some of these and read more. One of the things that does catch my attention, however, is why the King holiday should be repealed. Um, there clearly seems to be a strong sentiment here and perhaps a bias that I need to be aware of. So that's something that kind of catches my attention right off the bat. You want to always look for biases because, of course, you want your research to represent both sides of an issue. I'm going to go ahead and click on, let's read about the truth about King here. And of course, I'm immediately captured by the title, The Beast as Saint, The Truth About Martin Luther King Jr. So again, uh, seems to be a very strong opinion here. And as I scroll down and start to read about this, essentially, there are comparisons being made by the author of this site to Martin Luther King uh, as a communist, there's a bunch of, down here, there's a bunch of information about how much of what he wrote was plagiarized. It just kind of continues on. Here's some more. You can see a graphic here, a picture, talking more about how he was, in fact, a communist, and so on and so forth. At this point, if I know a little bit about Martin Luther King, I should certainly be questioning the validity of this site. I'm going to go back to the main page now. And another thing that um, is good to look at, you know, as you're looking at bias and so forth, is who wrote the site. So that's something that you want to look at. I'm going to go ahead and go down here, and I notice that it says Join MLK Discussion Forum hosted by Stormfront. Um, I, I don't see any place else on this page where it tells me who wrote this website or anything. It's about the closest I can find. So I'm going to go ahead and click on here and see who is hosting the site. And what I discover is the site is hosted by an organization called Stormfront. And this is a white nationalist organization, as you can see right here, White Pride Worldwide. Uh, we are a community of racial realists and idealists. We are white nationalists. So here you get a, a representation, an idea of who is actually hosting the site. So I would hope that at this point, uh, you would understand that this is not a reliable nor a credible site, that there is extreme bias on this site, and that 
martinlutherking.org is absolutely a site you should not use for any reason for research. So those are kind of some of the, the caveats, you know, warnings about what to look for in a site that might uh, raise a red flag and, and make you think twice about using something. So then how do you know what makes for uh, credible and reliable sources? Well, we're going to talk about that next. Now that I've given you a brief example of a website that is not credible, nor is it reliable, I want to look at then how do we make sure that our sources are credible and reliable. And what I'm going to take you here is a website called Purdue Al. It is a website created by Purdue University, and I think it is the preeminent or best website when it comes to research, um, citations for research, anything essentially to do with writing a research paper. And so I simply googled Purdue Al evaluating sources, and I'm going to go right here to this site. And they have a lot of information here. So you can see right here I'm at the evaluating sources of information. And right now what they're showing me is a basic overview that talks about how to evaluate sources. And the one, again, there's how to evaluate citations, evaluation during reading, print versus internet. I want to click on this one right now and kind of highlight what you should be looking for as you are conducting your research. So they have a wonderful uh, list here of some bullet points that remind us what are some of the things we should be looking for. So first of all, start by looking at what it is that the author is trying to accomplish. And again, if we go back to the martinlutherking.org website, it was very clear after we started to kind of engage in it that the author was clearly trying to persuade us to see Martin Luther King uh, in the way that he or she sees him. Checking for a list of references or other citations that will give you related material, that's a great way to see it. Um, if there are no references or citations, probably a red flag. Look at the intended audience. Try to determine if it's a fact, opinion, or propaganda. Again, looking at the Martin Luther King website, that was clearly an example of propaganda. So you're looking for something either factual or if it is opinion, that it is based on facts and that the person giving the opinion uh, is reputable. And we'll talk about that a little bit later down here on the list. Is there enough evidence offered? You know, and is there comprehensive coverage? Obviously, it should be in depth. Simply giving one or two examples of evidence is not enough. Is the language objective or is it emotional? Okay, so if it's emotional, again, we're probably looking at a strong bias. So the language should be relatively objective. Uh, are there just broad generalizations that really oversimplify the matter and don't look at it in detail? There should be a mix of primary and secondary sources. And this is what we talked about a moment ago. If the source is an opinion, it doesn't mean you can't use it. You just need to really see, does the author offer those reasons for adopting the stance they're taking? Uh, one thing to consider, is this person reputable? If you're on a medical website, for instance, and it is a doctor giving the information or the opinion, um, the person is probably reputable. You know, it's probably OK to use that. Check for accuracy uh, in two bullet points. I'll give you a way to do that. How timely is the source? This one's extremely important, especially if you are doing, for instance, let's say something in the field of science where information changes you know, literally on a daily basis. So if your information is out of date, obviously that can, uh, you may have false information then in your paper. So uh, make sure that you're using up-to-date sources there. Uh, when we're talking about checking for accuracy, one great way to do that, do some cross-checking. So can you find the same information elsewhere? If you look at four articles and three of them are providing similar information, you probably know that those are accurate and reliable sources. If one of the sources, though, the fourth one, really strays and provides some information you can't find in the other ones, you may want to question the reliability of that source. Kind of went over this a minute ago, how credible is the author or the organization? Again, going back to our example of the martinlutherking.org site, once we were able to see what organization was had created uh, the website, we found out that it was actually a white nationalist organization 
and therefore for there is uh, no credibility to the author. Again, are there just kind of these vague generalizations with no evidence? And are arguments one-sided? Um, that's obviously another red flag if they're not showing both sides of the argument. So this is a, a great way to evaluate your websites as you're reading them. And again, this whole section here is really valuable. Uh, one of the things here, I'm going to click on print versus internet just to remind you of something. As they explain here at the publication process, traditional print sources, so when you get something out of a book, a magazine, a newspaper, it goes through an extensive publication process as it talks about here. This includes fact checkers, multiple reviewers, and editors to ensure the accuracy and quality of the information. With the internet sources, essentially anyone with a computer and access to the internet can publish a website. So I could create one right now on World War II with all kinds of inaccurate information. And if you, as someone looking at the website, don't really think carefully about the reliability and credibility of it, you could end up with a lot of inaccurate information uh, and a lack of understanding about World War II for that reason. So this is what I just wanted to point out to you. Again, this Purdue Online Writing Lab is fantastic. As you can see here, they have all kinds of information I encourage you to go through and use, like how to conduct research, um, so an overview of that, some more information on searching the web and internet references. So really a wonderful, wonderful site. But what I wanted to focus on again today was just the evaluating sources of information so that as you sit down next time, you can think about, okay, how am I going to ensure that this is a reliable and credible website? And hopefully the tools you've been given in this video will help you do so. To finish off this video about our library, I want to talk to you briefly about copyright guidelines as well as plagiarism guidelines. The first thing you need to know about copyright is that typically for educational purposes, in other words, non-commercial, meaning that you're not going to make money from it, it's usually okay to borrow things uh, such as music and photos, which we'll talk about in a moment. And you are usually covered by something that is called fair use. And fair use means that you do not need prior authorization from the individual who created, for instance, a photo, nor do you have to pay a royalty or fee in order to use it. Um, again, what I want to emphasize with you is this is only when you are creating things for educational purposes. So if you are creating a slideshow for a class project or writing a paper, then um, this, this applies. But if you did, for instance, want to create something to try to make money off of it, then uh, different rules apply. You need to be aware of that. For photos, one site I would like you to be familiar with is Creative Commons. And essentially, if a photo is uh, considered to have um, a Creative Commons license, what that means is you are free to use it. And you can actually use that um, for commercial purposes as well. It means that it's out there and it's people are free to use it. Otherwise, though, you should still give credit. So again, if I was going to be creating a slideshow for a class project, you should still give credit underneath the photo, saying where you got the photo from. Uh, the same thing does apply for videos and music as well. So if you wanted to use a short clip from a video, if you wanted to use music, again, for educational purposes, you are covered and you are OK under fair use, but you should still give credit in your um, somewhere in your your show or whatever it is that you're doing. Now let's talk about plagiarism guidelines. So plagiarism is essentially when you steal someone else's ideas or thoughts without giving them credit. So as I've uh, pointed out right here, when you borrow someone's thoughts or ideas, even if you put it into your own words, you must give credit. Now, if you are directly borrowing someone's thoughts or ideas, you know that that's a quote, and you need to put it in quotation marks. If you put it in your own words, we call that paraphrasing or summarizing. But again, you have to give credit because you are borrowing someone else's thoughts or ideas. So this is extremely critical, and sometimes students get a little confused by this. Uh, to also make sure that you're avoiding plagiarism, you need to make sure that you are familiar 
with the format that your teacher wants you to use. This may be MLA, APA, and there are other formats as well. What I've seen at the high school level is the most uh, consistently used one is MLA. It's known as the Modern Language Association. And uh, in order to make sure that you are avoiding plagiarism, you want to, again, make sure that you're citing everything correctly. And a great resource to do this is Purdue OWL. We talked about uh, the Purdue OWL resource earlier on in this video, and they also have um, some wonderful information here on ensuring that you are citing your sources correctly. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So what I've done here is I've gone to Google and simply typed in Purdue OWL citations. And the first one that shows up here is the Purdue OWL Research and Citation. And it shows you specific styles and so forth. So if I know, for instance, that I'm being asked to do the MLA style, I click on that. And here are, is all the information it gives you. So it's very thorough. If I go into Research and Citation, it has all kinds of information here on how to conduct research, how to use it, and so forth. Again, it has the different styles. Let's go into MLA again. And you can see down here, it um, tells me some information about MLA. There's a guide and so on and so forth. Let's go ahead and come to MLA Guide. And what you'll see here is it starts with just some MLA formatting and style guide. That's the page I'm on. Um, but then it has all kinds of wonderful information. So it shows me how to do in-text citations. So that's when I'm actually going to be citing information within the text itself. Um, information on quotations and so on and so forth. You can see and then it has how to do your work cited page. It gives you some basic rules so you have a basic understanding of that. And then when you're looking at specific types, so if I'm trying to cite a book, I can click on here. It gives me information specific to how to cite a book. You can see down here and then go further. Here's your basic book format. It tells you how to do it. Gives you some examples down here, you know, with different scenarios. If the book has simply one author, more than one author, so on and so forth. Obviously, a lot of you will have electronic sources. So if we look at that gives you some information, starts off talking about URLs, for instance, and then as you scroll down, here's your basic style that you would use, and then again it gives you some very specific examples. If I'm citing an entire website, a page on a website, an image, an article in a web magazine, and so on and so forth. So again, you know, if like a photograph, if you're if it's not um, covered through Creative Commons, we just talked about previously with copyright, making sure to give um, credit to your source, and so this would explain, for instance, how to do that. So the Purdue Owl is just uh, the online writing lab. This is just a great source for all kinds of information, and really uh, just about any question you have about how to correctly cite your sources, you will be able to find here. So I would like to thank you very much for joining us on this video tour. Uh, you got to take a look at the library and then hopefully got some useful information about uh, things from citations to uh, you know, plagiarism and all kinds of things about you know, this, the kind of resources we have available to you here in the library and so on. And the most important thing I want to leave you with is if you ever have questions, want further help, that's why I'm here. So please come see me, uh, Miss Sanini always in the library, so I'm more than willing and happy to help, and I will leave you here with just some information on how to contact.